to the Pimp Your Brilliance podcast with Monique Malcolm, a show about creative people leveraging their brilliance to create their own opportunities. I aim to show you what's really possible when you shut down the chorus of fear and lean into your genius zone. You can learn more about this show and subscribe for updates by visiting keepchasingthestars.com backslash podcast. Hey, Star Chasers. This episode of Pimp Your Brilliance is brought to you by the Visionary Journal. The Visionary Journal is a goal-setting guide, mini vision board, and day planner. It provides a simple structure to help you break your goals into actionable steps that you can integrate into your daily life. For more information and to order your own copy of the Visionary Journal, visit keepchasingthestars.com backslash visionary journal. This is episode 17. For more information or show notes, you can find them at keepchasingthestars.com backslash 17. Hey guys, welcome to another wonderful interview. And today I am speaking with my biz bestie, Mrs. Amber Wright of TalkToAmber.com. I absolutely adore Amber. So I hope that comes across in our interview today. She tends to say that I'm a bit more reserved when it's business first and play later. So you guys let me know what you think about this interview. But Amber is a communications expert. So she helps her clients share their voice on stage, online and on paper. And she does such wonderful work for like so many top names online. It's it's ridiculous. And even names that are big offline, she's amazing at what she does. But the thing that I really brought her on the show to talk with us about is her transition from being a full-time college professor to full-time entrepreneur. Just in the recent last uh, couple of months, Amber has transitioned from teaching college to doing her business full time. And since she's so fresh and new, I thought it would be nice to have her give her take about how she planned to transition, how it is now that she's transitioned, and even give us some tips and some information about how you can do a better job of sharing your own voice. So I hope that you guys are ready. Grab your paper and your pencils and let's dive in. Hey, Amber, welcome to the show. And I want to jump right in and get started. So please tell the people who you are, what you do, and how you got started. Well, thank you for letting me hang out with you for a little bit. And I am a communication expert and coach. That, those are my, that's my formal title. And I work with entrepreneurs to teach them how to find their voice and tell their story online, on stage, and on paper. And I got my start doing that by just calling myself a public speaking coach because I was a college professor for a number of years and I've watched thousands of speeches <laughs> and I, I really love it. I mean, I love communication. I love public speaking and I love helping people tell their story. And so I figured that there was a way that I could build a business around that. And I started my coaching business about five years ago and I've been doing that ever since. Ooh. Okay. So you guys, full disclosure, Amber and I are like business besties. We talk all the time. So you're going to have to uh, get in and get a little cozy and try not to laugh at us kind of <laughs> doing the thing that we do, which is like all these random jokes inside things. But Amber's one of my favorite people and she really has like telling your story and communicating and saying the right things and being an overall better speaker, like really, really dialed in and I wanted her on the show today because she is newly um, 100% full-time entrepreneur. She left her teaching gig and people always ask me like, how do you know when it's time to make the transition? You know, how do you prepare for that? And I felt like, well, Amber's doing that now. So she's the perfect time. She is the perfect person to talk about that. So please, Amber, can you share a little bit about how you made that transition from full-time a uh, college professor to full time shoot. What do you call yourself now? Full time like CEO of Talk to Amber. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You know, I've actually been reluctant to call myself a CEO because I don't have nary an employee. OK, <laughs> um, but I will get there. I will get there. I feel like that's when you can call yourself a boss when you actually you know, run a business that involves other people. Um, and I will accept all of the claps and snaps for this transition because <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was a big leap, but it was something that I took my time in doing and how the story goes or as legend has it. I worked in student affairs and higher education for a long time. 
And I did that by day and I would teach at night and then I would run my business by late night. And I was a blogger for a long time. So I'd be up late writing posts and such. And I I did that for a long time. And initially blogging was just a creative outlet for me. But then there got a, there became a point where I decided that I wanted to have more autonomy in how I made money and how I spent my time. And that's when I got really serious about saying like, I want to run my own business. I want to be a for real entrepreneur. I had an event planning business before, but that was short lived because when I started going to grad school, I, I didn't really go far with, I stopped doing event planning so I could focus on school and I never, I never really went back to it. So entrepreneurship was always a part of my story, but the the chapter needed to be developed a little bit more. And how it all went down was I had my full time job in teaching and then blogging and then I phased blogging out and started my business. And three years after doing that, I decided to leave my full time. No, I left my full time job in 2014 and That way I could teach more classes, which would give me more of flexibility to run my business. And I said, I'm going to do this until I feel like I can then face teaching out because I think I could sustain myself with the business. So this has been a long journey to get here, but I took my time and I did it when I felt like I could do it and, and really walk into something formidable. So people, those of you who are sitting there thinking like, I can't do this full-time job. I'm ready to go. I don't want to do this anymore. I want my full time freedom. I want to reclaim my time. You know, as Ember just mentioned, it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it's a progressive stepping down a little bit. So going, like Amber said, from the full-time gig to teaching more classes, but, you know, opening up more time in her schedule to maybe taking on a few less classes or taking a, a summer off or a semester off till you get to the point where you can just leave it all together. It doesn't happen overnight. And I know there's all this, you know, glorification about have your time. You need your time, Freedom. If you don't build your dream, then you're going to spend your time building other people's dreams. Child, tune all of that advice out. Because it's it's advice that I feel like is really skirting over the whole fact that um, entrepreneurship takes a lot. It takes a lot of self-management. It takes a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of work. And if you don't have proper structures in place and you don't transition yourself properly, you'll be back at your full time job <laughs> in a short amount of time. <laughs> That's so true. And I. I want to I want to qualify. Well, explain one thing too. Um, I was an adjunct professor, so what that means is that I just teach. I taught part time at two different schools, and in my line of work, if you are an adjunct, then they kind of teach you that the holy grail is to get a full time position. And I just, I don't know, whenever I, I I applied for a couple of them, but I, you know, most times people take that job and they have it and for the rest of their lives, because it's a really good gig, but I just didn't feel like it was for me. So both when I had my full-time job working in student affairs, and then when I took on a full-time load of about four or five classes of teaching every semester, I was still really clear about how can I use where I'm at to leverage as leverage to doing what I really want to do, which is running my business. And Um, that process is going to look different for everybody. And once I started getting, I guess, more visibility, you could say online, people thought that I was doing that exclusively because I was the flavor of the month in Facebook groups and people would always tag me and all of that, (laughs) which I'm grateful for. I'm so grateful for that exposure and for delivering a quality enough product or experience for my clients that they wanted to tell more people about me. But I also have two kids and a mortgage to pay. So (laughs) I had to be really mindful about how I paced myself and planned this journey. And people will be like, oh, you're still doing that? You're still teaching? And I'm like, yeah, my kids still got to (laughs) eat. So (laughs) once I get to a place where I feel like I'm ready, now that's not a pass to just stall your life away. Like at some point you do have to make the jump, but it's okay to do it in a way that makes sense for your lifestyle and your goals and your plans. Yes. Amen. So at this point, you've been, you know, about a month or so into this full-time 
entrepreneurship. So what has surprised you the most about working for yourself? Oh, man, I'm really only 18 days in, Monique. That's a hard question. (laughs) But I think what has surprised me the most and this, I don't know if this is going to even sound right, but that I could really do it because before the decision, there's all this anxiety of, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? And already I'm, I'm on pace to hit my money goals. I'm doing okay these first 18 days in, and I, I'm not going to say that I feel like you should have done this sooner. Like, I don't feel that way, but I'm like, I guess maybe how naturally it's coming to me, but I think that it feels that way because I took so long to get to this point, if that makes sense. So I, um, it's kind of like, uh, 1999. Do you remember 1999? I don't know how old you were turning the year before 2000, but the whole like Y2K thing and people kind of quietly held their breath yes. at midnight on January, <laughs> December 31st, 1999. We didn't know if the world was going to implode or whatever the case. And it's like, Oh, we're still here. It's the same that anticipation all before it happens fades. And then you're like, okay, it's here. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm figuring it out. I'm working it. And, you know, I'm, I'm surprised at how smooth the transition has felt for me. That's because you prepared and you planned ahead of time. But I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about what you're an expert at, which is finding your voice and sharing your story. So in the last year, you've done events, you've done, you know, bios for like some top dollar, do, uh, some top dollar clients You've written a book. You've done all these things. So I want to know, how do you help your clients navigate, like finding their voice and and being able to share their story? I have this process where I talk to every single client (laughs) because you you have to, whether I'm right doing something written or coaching them, you know, we we really have these very in-depth conversations. And this is where I am most proud of my listening skills because I am an extrovert. And I feel like sometimes extroverts get a bad rap in that everyone thinks we're these terrible listeners and we're always like, come talk to me. Like we're going to just make you eat you alive with all of our words. But some of us are really good listeners. And I, I try to tap into that when I'm working with my clients. Because I recognize that my job is not to write their story for them literally. It's just to pull out of them some things that they couldn't see about their story in order to connect the dots, if that makes sense. So I like that part of the process of listening to the things that they say and the things that they don't say and weaving all of that together. The way I describe it is when you work with me, it's like you have all these ideas in your mind that are like clothes tumbling about in a, in a, in a dryer. And I'm the one that comes and opens the dryer once the cycle stops spinning. And I take all of your clothes out. I shake them out, fold them up and give them back to you to where you're like, oh, man, my clothes, they smell good. They smell like gain and they're all fresh. And but they were clothes that you already had. They're ideas that you already had. I just organize them and clean them up for you in a way that feels authentic. Oh, I love that analogy. So let me ask you this. What are some questions that you ask your clients or that you would ask somebody to help them think more deeply about what it is they want to say? That's giving away my goods. My, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it, it kind of, the conversation informs itself. I'll start out with a certain set of questions that I'll have. It's almost like you interviewing a guest. You might have a set of questions that you know you're going to ask them or that you have that you can just pull out of your bank if the conversation is a little dry or whatever the case. But sometimes you might talk to someone and it flows really well and you're and it inspires more questions out of you or in you. I take that same approach with interviewing my clients. So I I'll, I'll, I always start by saying the first question is so who are you? I'll, if you and I were on the phone, I would be like, who is Monique Malcolm? And then they'll say, huh, <sighs> who am I? It's a really loaded question to start a conversation with, but it allows us to kind of just get to that, that point in the very beginning. And then from there, we just let that story unfold. Oh, see, so look at you, all these unfolding stories, folding clothes, organizing <laughs> <your> ideas. <laughs> 
I love it. I love it. I love it. So uh, let me ask you this at this point. Um, I keep saying at this point, I need you. I need your help. I need you to coach me <laughs> to having better transition words for these questions. But, you know, now that you are working full time, you're helping people find their voice and sharing their story. How is it that you're able to sustain your business? Because you mentioned a little bit ago about being on track to hit your money goals. So how exactly do you make money in your business? So as I mentioned, when I started, I said that I help people to find their voice and tell their story online, on stage and on paper. And I have my services aligned to meet those three channels. On stage is designed specifically for speakers. So if you are someone who wants to speak and get paid to speak, then you need your signature talk. You need to know what your message is going to be and what, what you're going to build your platform on and who you're, who needs to hear that message. So we can work together on that. And there's a package for that. It's like Staples. That was easy. Or no, there's an app for that. <laughs> um then the next one is for people who need help with their online branding and they're just trying to figure out like, gosh, I want what people read about me to be cohesive and consist- consistent. I stumble when I try to tell people what it is that I do. And so then I draw that out of them and then we kind of summarize the call and that becomes a platform for their their personal brand it's, and, you know, people who have brands that are online, present online like you and, and me. And so there's a package for that. And then the other is, okay, I need a new about me for my website and I just need to have it be a little bit stronger the way that people read about what I do. And then there's an option for that. So though that's the foundation on which I built my business. And then I also have my book and then it's called, Can We Talk? 10 Life Lessons on Finding Your Voice and Finding Yourself. So there's things around that. I teach courses and webinars, so there's money coming in that way. And um, I kind of just flex in between those three, but the but those three meaning my services and products. So that's only two. But so no, there is <laughs> but I was thinking of the, the third one. You speak yeah. and people pay you to come. Oh, yeah, just say this. <laughs> but, yeah, there we go. <laughs> in my mind yes that's the other facet is I am a speaker my I feel like I'm doing a commercial for my brand sorry but (laughs) the other aspect is I too am a speaker so I present myself on stages at conferences and I do teach like trainings and workshops on what it means to find your voice how to how to perfect your elevator pitch all of that I do as well so I'm a busy bee You are a busy bee, my favorite bee. But um, I want to circle back to you speaking because something that you really made me aware of as a speaker, I think with what I do online, I've always thought of myself as speaking at like conferences related to like creativity and business, because that's the space that I work in online. And, you know, those are kind of the circles that I travel in. But I know early on in our friendship, you started doing like events for corporations and like trainings at like big businesses and things like that stuff that I hadn't thought about. And I always just kind of thought like in my, my time when I did work at a a full-time job, uh, when they would have trainings, it would be like people from the County or people within the organization coming in. I never really considered that the company hires people outside of the company to come in and speak. So can you talk a little bit about that? Cause that is an Avenue that I don't think people even really I don't want to say people don't tap into, but I think sometimes we don't even realize that there's opportunity there. Absolutely. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. My first corporate gig came from a former colleague of mine. We used to work together at at a university and then she took this job at this big corporation and she was working in training and development. And when they mentioned that they were looking for some new trainers to come in, she mentioned my name and that opened the door for me to get into that. And why I call it a moment of transparency is because I don't think a lot of people are fully honest about it. They just want you to think that like, yeah, I hit the ground running and I was like pitching all these people, which is part of it. Like you do have to do that. But that's how I got my start. And 
why that's important and why it's relevant to this conversation is because the only reason why she knew that I was someone that could be referred was because I was working on my business while we worked together. And I used that opportunity at my full-time job. Even when I didn't want to work there anymore, I still found ways that I could use it to almost like a trampoline into my personal goals which was to become a speaker and to build my own business. So I was able to do trainings and presentations while I worked on campus. And she saw me doing that. She experienced me doing that, knew I was very good at it and knew that I was trying to build a business around it. So then when we both were no longer even working at that same job, she remembered me and referred me to her boss. And I was able to come on board and do the series of trainings for them. And so that the point that I want to make there is that you got to use what you got to get what you need. And had I not been diligent about figuring out opportunities where I could uh, really leverage my my work experience or like just use the platform that I was already at with my full time job instead of oh, I hate this job and I'm so ready to get out of here. I would have missed opportunities to have shown people what I was capable of. And it worked out in the in the long run for me. And I think that people don't think about how else can I present my skills and talents? I think you are one of the truly just the, one of the smartest people I've ever met. You're so good at you. I mean, you specifically money. (laughs) You're so good at strategy and planning and breaking things down and actionable steps. Like that's a gift. And I've always admired that about you. So it's trying to figure out how can I take some of those things that I am naturally good at and then transfer it into a skill that's going to help somebody else? And sometimes I think we just don't know how to actually go about that. But once you do think about it that way to say, hmm, I'm not just you know, one trick pony. Like there's other things that I'm good at. Then you can kind of think of, well, who else would need this kind of help that I could offer them? And then that opens up the door for you to consider other ways to present yourself as an expert. Boom. There you have it. And I want to tap you for something else because you guys, you don't know this about Amber, but Amber is like a really good person uh, when it comes to attending events and like really connecting with people and networking. I don't know if she sees herself as this, but and I think it, it could just be a byproduct of her being a communications expert. But I swear when we talk about like recaps of events we've attended or, you know, things that she's attended, she like remembers everybody's name. And she's like, I met this person and I'm following up and I'm working with this person. I mean, like, she's really, really good at it. And I'm terrible at this because I'm like, I'm going to totally email that person. And then like a year later, I'm like, I'm still going to totally email that person. And I never do it. And I don't remember (laughs) anybody's name, which is horrible. I'm so horrible at names. But what advice or tips do you have for people who are attending conferences? or events and they want to connect with people like how do they break the ice and then how do they you know continue this budding relationship after they've made that initial contact that's a great question and I I I think that there's so much discussion about introversion and extroversion and how that plays a role with how we network with people. And I always tell people just to think in advance about what you want to get out of the experience. And when you do that, it's like, okay, who do I want to meet and who do I want to connect with? Thinking about that in advance, even if it's on the flight to the conference, (laughs) it takes some of the anxiety and the overwhelming feeling about like, oh, I got to meet all these people and say, all right, I want to have a quality interaction with three people. And maybe you go through the conference schedule or look through the list of speakers and say, yeah, I want to talk to this person, this person and this person because I like what they're doing. I want to let them know that I like what they're doing or I have an idea of how we could connect or whatever the case may be. And I think once we move forward with that intention, it makes it a little bit easier. I don't know where, how I ended up being able to remember people's names like that. And I think (laughs) (laughs) 
part of it comes from me being a teacher. It was really important to me as an instructor that I learned my students' names right away because I wanted them to know that I saw them as a, as a person and I respected them as a person and they weren't just numbers or ID numbers on a sheet of paper, that they were real people to me. So I would learn, I would just really got to train myself to commit their names to the memory. So I think that that just translated outside of the classroom. But um, I think just thinking about what your goals are and what your intentions are with going wherever you want to go will make it easier. And like I mentioned before, I love people. I love hearing stories. I love talking to folks. But I also know when I need to tap out myself because conferences can be really overwhelming and there's so much stimulation and so much happening. So I do that myself, even as an extrovert. So that way I know, okay, you're kind of reaching your quota here. Maybe you might want to go back to the room and chill out for a little bit or um that, that, that kind of just guides me as I'm moving about the place. And then here's a tip too with business cards. I will maybe, well, I didn't even take any to the last conference that I went to. I need to order some more, but I don't take any more than 10 business cards to any event that I go to because I ain't go, I don't want everybody's card. <laughs> and some people just like to shove them down your throat and you, you have these really like, just trivial interactions with people. But if I know that I only have a really limited amount to give out, that means I'm only going to give them to somebody that I feel like I want to actually do business with or to connect with in same way with me accepting a certain amount of business cards. I won't take everybody's card because I, I mean, I want, I'm probably not going to follow up with you. And you know what that's like. You get home and you have this huge, huge batch of cars of people you ain't going to never talk to. Whereas, all right, I met these five people and these are the people that I want to follow up with. It makes it a little bit easier that way. Fun fact, I am a conference dodger <laughs> and Amber knows this. I will go to conferences. I love going to conferences and I love meeting people. But if it starts and I'm not even an introvert. But I, I do need like decompression time. So if things start feeling like uh, it's too much, I will leave in a heartbeat and like go and find food or <laughs> go walk around or go get ice cream or something <laughs> random. <laughs> I do it all the time and I, I have like no shame about it. I'm also like the person that's always at the dessert table at the conference. So if you want to meet me at a conference, I mean, come at me with like a cookie or a cupcake and I'm, I'm, I'm there. And that is not a lie, y'all. <laughs> She's not telling a lie at all. I've seen it happen. And that's why we're friends, because if you want Monique, is, Monique, there's a foot difference between Monique and I. She, I'm little and she's tall. And so you want to see big and tall, little and short at the dessert table. That's going to be me and her. <laughs> it's so funny. So I want to switch gears again because we're getting kind of towards the end here. But um, I really try to be really candid on this show about entrepreneurship and how it's not all glamorous. And I, I try to get people to be as real about their struggles and their challenges as possible, because even though I believe everybody should totally pimp their brilliance, and that doesn't mean that you need to have a full time business. You can use your brilliance to have a side hustle or, you know, um, get a, a promotion at work if that's what you seek. But I do kind of talk a lot about entrepreneurship because that's the space that I'm in. But can you tell us about some of your challenges? Like, what do you feel is a challenge that you have to deal with as a entrepreneurship, um, as an entrepreneur? Oh, man. I think right now, today, my most pressing challenge is deciphering what areas of my business I need help in. And once I know what those areas are, so that by that, I mean, okay, laying out my standard operating procedures or SOPs as we call them and say, all right, if I have to check out because I got the flu, will my business survive? And do I have somebody to help me? Or if I had to shut the business down, could I go to my husband and say, okay, go on my computer and this is what you need to do. This is who you need to email. Like wh what are my processes and, and how can I streamline things? So I'm actively working on trying to figure that out because I am a party one. I have a VA and in, in full disclosure, I do have a VA, but um, we do a minimal amount of work together. And so I'm trying to figure out, okay, how best can I scale the use of her services? So that way I can feel like I'm doing what I need to do the most, which then becomes like business development and going out and meeting people and pitching and all this other stuff so that way my business can continue to grow. And that's on a technical level. And on a personal level, I would say my biggest challenge is turning on my 
spidey sense. (laughs) And we were talking about this earlier with just really assessing my relationships and making sure that I'm nurturing my offline relationships. I'm, I'm really fortunate that I'm very richly blessed in the way of friendships. I've got a lot of really good quality relationships with people who build me up and um, make me feel loved and supported. And it's important that you don't lose sight of those people when you are trying to build your business because it's very easy to because business can be all consuming. And sometimes when you interact with folks, not everybody means you well. Sometimes people just want to hitch a ride on your wagon wherever you're going. Or or as I like to call it, they want a star in your galaxy. (laughs) And um, not everybody deserves a spot in your galaxy. So just kind of knowing, all right, who's team Amber and who's not and making sure that I know the difference and that I am nurturing the people who are team Amber all day. (laughs) Whoop whoop. I'm totally team Amber. So those were your challenges. What do you feel have been your keys to success? Working super mega hard at everything and being excellent at everything that I do, even when I my numbers were small. Like I remember my very first webinar, there were six people, three of whom I begged, like my, they were my friends, like just be like a fake person for me. <laughs> and then I had, I, just, I had all these illusions, like I'm going to have 20 people on this webinar and it's going to sell out so fast and so easy. And it was like, the internet was like, oh girl, that's not happening for you. <laughs> but I had three people who did pay and I had to rejoice in that and say like, hey, it's not 20, but it was three. And that means it's worth it to somebody. Um, and on that webinar, I acted and I presented as if there was still like those same 20 people on there. I always committed to giving my best and to doing my best in everything that I do. I think what has also worked for me is being a pleasure to work with. And when you are a pleasure to work with and you deliver quality results, that A plus B equals C and C is a referral. (laughs) And referrals have been such an integral part of my business growth. And I think that that's a formula that works on and offline. So, um, yeah, just focusing on what I'm good at and not worrying about the next chick and what she doing, but minding my own business and being diligent at what I do and not being afraid to learn and to fail, I think has worked to my advantage. Okay, so if you had to sum this all up into your biggest, brightest, best lesson learned in your journey so far, what's the one single lesson? The one single lesson is that there is no race. You're not racing against anybody when it comes to how you should or should not measure success in your business. So take your time because there's no race. You, you, it's only you and focus on you and focus on being the best you can be. And it all, it'll, it will work out. Boom. She said it. So here's my last two questions because we're closing up here. Mm -hmm. Um, The Pimp Your Brilliance Action Challenge, which is you sharing three tips or advice for someone who is looking to find their voice this year. Wait, say that one more time. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So my question is, uh, this is the Pimp Your Brilliance Action Challenge. So this Mm -hmm. is where you share three pieces of advice or tips for someone who is looking to find or share their voice this year. Ooh, okay. Uh, To pick your brilliance as it relates to finding your voice, first, you need to really think, kind of like we were talking about before, one, know that your gift is somebody else's struggle. So that one thing that you almost feel silly thinking about because it comes so easily to you, that's your gift. And what you're gifted in, someone else has struggle with. And knowing that, be willing then to free somebody out of their struggle by using your gift. So that's the second part. Once you've identified it, don't be afraid to use it because knowing that using it is going to help someone else. And the only way that you can use it is to speak it. Like you have to kind of find your, to me, finding your voice is synonymous with finding your truth and trusting what what you know to be true on the inside. And a lot of that is, is in alignment with your gifting. So when you think about, okay, in other words, what am I good at? 
who can I serve? And then being willing to tell them, tell people like, hey, this is what I'm good at. And this is how I can serve you with what I'm good at. That's how you can preempt your brilliance and find your voice. All right. And my final question is, what books are you currently reading or have you read recently that have blown your mind? I just started the other day, The Perfect Find by Tia Williams. My commitment this year is to read one book for pleasure and one book for business this year. Every, you know, so two books a month. And I'm really enjoying it's off to a good start. I heard really great things about The Perfect Find. So that's my personal book. The so the professional book I haven't started yet. So the one that has blown my mind. Gosh, I don't know that I've read a book recently that has really I think it was What I Know For Sure by Oprah. That book really was like, gosh, she's so wise. (laughs) She's so all knowing. And I really admire her. So to kind of soak in some of the things that she said about life and being sure of your path and finding your path really spoke to me. Um, So that would be my vote for that one. All right. So you guys, you know, I will have those in the show notes. But this was so good. I love interviewing you, Amber. I wish I could interview you every single episode, but I think people would get annoyed with that. So No, they wouldn't because we're just a bowl of fun, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> we really are. If you and we're being all super professional today, but y'all, if you were in our little chats, then they would, they, 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 it'd be a blast. <laughs> it would be a blast. We're, we're kind of hilarious. And Amber says I'm shady. But I don't think so. I'm I'm a ray of sunshine. Um, but if you guys want a good time, you need to get a conference with me and Amber together because it would be yes. Good time. <laughs> but thank you again for giving your time and sharing with us so candidly and so openly. It's always a pleasure to chat with you, and it's even more of a pleasure to chat with you via recording that everybody gets to hear. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited. I love the show. I love you and everything that you're doing. And I'm excited to be a part of it. And that's it for this week's episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you love the show, make sure you grab the Be Brilliant Guide where I share the keys to success for my most popular guests. Download it at keeptracingthestars.com backslash brilliant. Now go out there and pimp your brilliance.